All right, guys, welcome back to the Sex and Bacon podcast. On today's episode, I actually have with me a guest. Her name is Mona, and she's here to share with everybody a little bit about it's the Answers organization, the background of it, um, the purpose of it, and then we'll actually get into a little bit of her story as well. So welcome, Mona. Thank you for coming on here and sharing with everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, so we'll kind of jump right into it. Can you explain to everybody listening what Answers is? Well, it's sort of twofold. One is we um, certainly are part of the Canadian Alliance for Sex Work Law Reform. Um, they, they have about 25 allied uh, groups across Canada that um, combined with them work toward changing legislation. And uh, there's there's a battle going on right now, both in the House of Commons and also in the courts. So what we're aiming for is decriminalization, of course, and it's a, a long, hard-fought uphill battle. But that's part one. Part two is we um, we incorporated in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we are incorporated for the province as a nonprofit, and we are sex worker led sex worker support group. Uh, we do have a number of different things that we can do for our clients. Uh, we offer, we have vetted 15 different counselors that are sex worker friendly. Um, so they can, they can ask for any kind of counseling and choose their own. And we can provide up to 75% of the cost of that. We offer um, vetted accountants that we can connect sex workers with so that they can be up to date with their filings. Um, sometimes when we've got uh, money from grants, we can offer financial assistance sometimes with um, things like gift cards and small amounts of assistance with rent, that sort of thing. Um, we have a monthly online art studio that people find therapeutic. So that's, that's sort of a thing. We have a respite room that has a computer, a printer. We have sex, sex, um, safe sex supplies and a little library of sex worker related books. Um, so we can refer somebody to a financial planner. We have sobriety without stigma. It's a support group that's every two weeks. Um, so there's an abundance of things that we try to do. So people, oh, we even do help with uh, licensing because in Alberta, all the larger municipalities have various various uh, bylaws in place that mm -hmm. require licensing. And in Edmonton, in any case, we are able to drop the costs for anybody getting a license so that it's not a barrier. So f the finances are not a barrier to getting a license. And we'll walk them through the process too because it's a little cumbersome. Right. So was this kind of put into like, because I've done interviews with um, like, a sex worker that, that was out of van. Um, I worked with another one. So it seems like, I mean, like, I guess at like any job, there's, I guess there's ones who make really good money at it and ones who maybe they're in the lifestyle, but for different reasons, because a lot of what you guys are providing is some financial support. And I think most people have this idea that, I mean, sex workers or escorts, you know, are making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, whether it's a day or a month, and they have this sort of, not glamorous, but like a higher end lifestyle of what they can afford, no different than say, like a stripper, right? So right. do you guys find you are working with women more in the industry that it, it's just like any industry, some people will become millionaires in their lifetime, and others mm -hmm. will forever work a menial job and get minimum wage. And and there's everything in between, and we are no different. Okay. So it's nice, though, then, that you guys actually have the organization and the support system for everybody, that there's obviously no discrimination. We are, we are absolutely inclusive, and we are, um, we are non-judgmental. Uh, we're open to all diversities. We understand intersectionality, and... We're just here to support people that need support. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the people that do make top dollar, um, they don't come to us. They don't need to. Right. Uh, but they might. They might want 
referrals anyway. They might want a sex worker friendly accountant because when your accountant moves on for whatever reason, Mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of stuck sitting there like, how am I going to explain this to the next accountant? It's not a comfortable position to be in. So we, even for them, we can, we can do some, something for them. Okay. And it is all sex worker based led women who are part of the organization who've put it together are actually sex workers themselves. They are sex workers or they are ex sex workers. I think I, I believe that five out of the eight of us mm-hmm. are ex or sex um, workers. And I think we have one ally and we've got two lawyers. Okay. And you know, they're, they're not uh, sex workers or ex workers, but they are allied very strongly with our, our, our organization and really like the work that we do. So nice. they're board members. It's yeah. uh, one of your guys' slogans on the pamphlet that the brochure that I had was sex work is work. And I loved it because I think that's been the biggest thing is people just seem to think that being a sex worker or an escort, it's not considered a job. It's considered something tacky and taboo that somebody is doing with their body when in all reality, it is still considered a profession. It's something somebody is doing for money, whether they agree with it or not. It is still a job. There's a lot of hard work that goes into you being a sex worker as you know you would know yourself, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, my, my first job when I came into the city was as a dishwasher. Now, there's a job that I didn't really much care for, but I did it because I needed to make money. Right. Um, so this nonsense about, you know, the, everybody, oh, the poor girl, she needs to make money. Everybody needs to make money. Mm-hmm. And it's just a matter of which job you land on that will make you that money. So, you know, a crying crisis that we are just so impoverished that this is the only choice. No, it's a choice. We make mm-hmm. it. Uh, some of us do like it. Some of us don't maybe like it. But at the end of the day, we're the ones paying our bills and we're the ones that have to live with our choices. Right. Um, and me personally, I've worked other other jobs. And I always like to say it, sex work is the only work that I have not uh, quit. And I've been doing this since I was 19 in the late 70s. So you do the math. Okay, wow. So I have to ask then, because you said you're not out. So does that just mean you're not public with friends and family about being a sex worker? Or... Right. My friends know, but my family and my neighbors do not. And okay. it's none of their business. Yes, so, yeah, absolutely. For all, all and many varied reasons, it's just, I'm quite happy keeping things the way they are. So do you guys provide support for, we say, women who are in the business, but they're looking to get out and they just don't know how? Currently, no, because, I, I mean, maybe I'm part of the holdout, but I find that if you want to get out of something, you get out of something. When I right. didn't like dishwashing, I figured out a way to become a cook because I preferred that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always a way out if that's really what you want. But in truth, and I think this is where, where my holdout begins, mm-hmm. many years ago, okay, a couple of decades ago, I was talking to somebody who worked for an abolitionist group and uh, we were talking because there was a group of us and somebody asked her what the recidivism rate was because they themselves did help people exit Mm -hmm. the sex industry and she said the rate was 14 (laughs) and my eyebrows went up and I'm thinking if somebody told you they were trying to quit smoking 14 times would you just start laughing I would (laughs) it's like okay you're not serious about this Mm -hmm. obviously so I mean part of the problem is that um, a lot of the prohibition prohibitionist groups would dangle that carrot it's like yeah we'll give you this carrot but you have to uh, try to quit and mm-hmm. so you need that damn carrot. So you will say whatever it takes to get that damn carrot. And uh, and then in all reality, you might even take a few steps toward exiting, but that's not really what you wanted. What you wanted was a carrot and there was only one way to get it. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're back at sex work until you find yourself in some great need. And they are there to provide that. But again, with the codicil that you will quit work so you say yes again and again and again and uh it's it's just so uh, it's it's cruel actually Mm -hmm. i i don't see why people have to put conditions on help that's not really help 
No, it's true. Actually, years ago, my mom actually worked for crime prevention in um, Grand Prairie. And one of the the projects and the organizations that they worked with was to help um, the prostitutes, the escorts on the street to get out of that. And they would provide them with um, resources to in Vancouver, there was some sort of program there that they would get them there. But the the deal was, is they had to come up with the money for the bus ticket, and then everything else would be covered for them to be in the program. But they weren't allowed to get the money through doing escorting. And it's like, these girls work (laughs) on the street. This is what they have. And you're saying we will help you, but only if you provide $60 for a bus ticket, but you cannot get the bus ticket money by the only means that you know how. So to me, I was like, how is that helping them? (laughs) You know? It's a joke, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I guess that is the difference. There is women who in the industry probably do want out. And then there's women in the industry who who like what they do. They're happy with the freedom that it gives them, the schedule that it gives them. They're in control of their choices for it. They're in control of their life and can either work as much or as little as they want in you know, a world where everything else seems to be kind of, I guess, controlled for you. Correct. You know? Yeah, we find the same thing. We we get a lot of people that do sign up for our services. I think we've had about 400 people sign up just in 2022. And uh, every now and again, somebody puts into the comments, um, I'm really trying to quit sex work. And then you... you you phone them and talk to them and it turns out they just say that because they've been programmed to say that. Mm-hmm. And this is really sad. Um, I, I quickly say sex work is work and we don't uh, judge and we don't see any mm-hmm. point in shaming because that's just wrong. And uh, be proud that you can earn a living and pay your bills and not, not you know, have to take handouts from the government usually Mm -hmm. because that's you know i mean obviously if you're on ace or something you need that and this is gonna that doesn't pay for much and you're gonna still need a little sex work just to get you through the month but for the most part uh, sex workers are autonomous they're Mm -hmm. actually independent contractors the city of edmonton sees us as city you know independent contractors which we really appreciate um it's a little bit of a surprise to the brand new sex worker that that is what they are right but uh, i don't know if you know this but the city of edmonton actually has a course that is mandatory that every sex worker needs to take and uh so the city looks at it this way they want to take make us take the course so that that gives them the first opportunity to see if we're there of our own volition Mm -hmm. or somebody's behind us pushing us and um and secondly they want us to know our rights they want to know, want us to know about the laws, both municipally and federally, mm-hmm. and uh, and they sort of guide us through the process. So it's kind of, it's a good thing, and and it's changed too in the recent years. Uh, Twenty five years ago, if you had had any kind of sex work related crime, you know, you might have been soliciting on the streets or something like that. Mm-hmm. You could not get a sex worker license. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had to really wrap our heads around that knowing that okay so i'm a sex worker on the street now i want to become legal technically legal Mm -hmm. but i can't become a sex worker because i i'm guilty of being a sex worker yes that makes perfect sense (laughs) and i mean all that really does is force people to continue to do it illegally per se in the eyes of the city yeah Yeah. so they've come a long way they don't do that to us anymore Mm -hmm. in fact they're pretty pretty good even if you have a criminal record of some sort if you are if it's not a violent crime Mm -hmm. and or it's not a theft generally you can still get a license and even if it is something in your past if it is pardonable Mm -hmm. so more than two years on a on a what is it misdemeanor more than five years on a federal level charge if it's pardonable they will bypass that and you can even if you haven't gone through the pardoning process you can still get a license okay so what do you think is i mean so like you said you started doing this in would you say the 70s late 70s yeah. late 70s so they'll compare it from the late 70s to now 
What have you noticed as the biggest change as far as the way that society views sex workers, escorts? Um, what is it that you felt personally from them then to now that you notice a shift well, in? In the late 70s, we didn't have social media. We do now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more than just, you know, groups like ours. It's the average sex worker that, you know, has Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever mm -hmm. they're using. And they're getting the word out that they're just like everybody else. They're your neighbor. They're your friend. They're your, you know, mm -hmm. relative quite often. And there's, they're getting the word out that we're not. We shouldn't have to be relegate, renegated to the sides of uh, society. We are part of society. It is becoming more accepted, but I'll tell you the pushback from the prohibitionists is significant. And they have a lot of resources. They have a lot of money backing them. And they, they won't even have the dignity to call us um, sex workers. They call us sex trade workers workers and prostitutes because mm -hmm. they like to they like to scorn us and they like to shame us and they like to stigmatize us and i just think they're so disingenuous because they're pretending to be good christians that actually they're really crappy christians mm -hmm. oh absolutely i mean especially if you really think about the whole um acceptance non-judgment love everybody kind of thing it's like we'll love everybody yeah. who follows these rules we will love you as long as you align with this book that we have in front of us from this person who told us to follow this book you know precisely yeah so no and, I, and I agree and don't think outside the box ever mm -hmm. just follow faithfully like every sheep should totally yeah, no, I 1000% agree with that, um, which yeah. is really shitty because there is a lot of sex workers who have husbands and children and families and they can separate the two from the job and my personal life. And there's a lot of men who can do that as well for their in their relationships. It's no different than, you know, men who have women, wives who work in porn or any other industry where sex work is part of it. There is that acceptance and that separation, and yet it still seems that, you know, people who, it seems like the people who aren't involved in the industry have the biggest struggle with it, but everybody in the industry, men and women, they've accepted it, and it's like you're trying to convince everybody else to accept your life choices that do not affect you, but but they think it's their right to. Right. It, it's... Uh... Everybody, I, I don't even understand what that great need is to mm -hmm. busybody into somebody else's personal life. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. I don't get it either, to be honest. <laughs> um, so for you, to get into a little bit of your story then, why did you personally get into sex work? What was it that was your drive to kind of switch into that industry? Well, everybody's different, but for me... I, I was 13. I was still a virgin. I was reading a book on prostitution. Uh, it wasn't a, it was, it actually was a book on sex, but it had this one chapter on prostitution. And I, I uh, thought about it and it's like, okay, so let me get this straight. Everybody is going to have sex. Uh, some people will capitalize on sex. I didn't see the problem. <laughs> I was 13 and it just made perfect sense to me. Okay. I love the logic behind that. <laughs> and you think in a capitalistic society, people would be really quite comfortable with women making money, <laughs> but it does not seem to make them happy. I don't understand it. If it was men that were the majority making money, it would be all pats on the back. Good for mm -hmm. it. You know, kudos to you, man, and onward and upward. But because it's women, uh, no, we just can't have that. It's funny you say that because when I actually think about that, I think like if there was guys out there that like to their buddies, they were being like, so let me get this straight. You bang women on the weekend. You get to have sex four or five times, you know, every Friday, Saturday, and you're making a ton of money off of it, they'd be like, sweet, you know, fuck, good for right. you. Yeah. 100%. It'd be the pat on the backs and like, you lucky bastard, you're get bastard, you're getting laid, you know, so many <laughs> I times. Know. I can't even get my wife to fuck me twice a week and you're getting fucked, you know, five times a day. <laughs> like, Precisely. that's the reality. Yes. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, so what did you start in? Did you start in like massage parlors? I started parlors? on the street. 
okay well, on the streets because back then there was no massage parlors right uh really you either worked on the street or you worked in bars i could never figure out which bar so so i worked on the street and was that scary for you um did you I'm have any fears I'm not going to say it wasn't at all scary, mm -hmm. but uh, for the most part, nothing bad happened mm -hmm. and it, it was just fine. Yeah. Um, I think the first, first time out was scary, scary in the same sense that just about any time you do something for the first time is the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, no, I mean, I went out every day and I worked a couple of hours and I'm, I was young, so I was happy to, pay my bills and party hardy for two years and slowly yeah. times changed laws changed I became an escort got a car and started seeing clients in their own home mm -hmm. until I realized that for some reason the city of Edmonton was really backing body rubs and uh, eventually I thought well can't beat him join him my phone wasn't ringing as an escort until after the body rubs closed that was my first clue that mm -hmm. everybody was going to those and I finally ended up in a body rub. So I've pretty much done the, all of those things. I've done online um, sex as well. And mm -hmm. the only thing I haven't done is stripping. Okay. So do you see this kind of being um, something that you would essentially, this will be your permanent job and you would just retire from this when you're ready to retire? Well, if you've done the math, you know, I'm pretty close to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty close to retiring. And yeah it's it's fine yeah so for safe friends or people who aren't in the industry that meet you and you know they they hear your story or you share it with them um do you ever find that you meet younger women or women who kind of want i guess mentorship and coaching on how to get into the industry rules of things that you know maybe mistakes you've learned across the years of things not to do things to look out for when it comes to doing this safely well all of the above for sure but mm -hmm. uh one of the problems with all of that is that we do have federal laws and the federal laws dictate that you do not mentor okay <laughs> you're really not supposed to now colleague to colleague yeah, you know, if somebody asks a question, for sure, you can answer it, but you mm -hmm. certainly can't go out of your way and say, hey, do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, interesting. The only thing I will 100% of the time do is if I hear somebody's going on a car date, it's like I implore you do not do that because people go missing. Oh, so like meeting up with somebody getting in their vehicle. Yeah, and I have a friend that's been missing since 2019. So it's a very real thing. They found yeah. a car. I know that she hopped into his and never to be seen again. Okay. And uh, it's a it's a horrible thing for her family to go through because they are forever tormented. Mm -hmm. Do you find that when it comes to situations like that of people going missing once the not the media but once say you know legal finds out that they are sex workers do you find that there's less attention to mm -hmm. well a funny thing happened in canada a few years ago canada uh decided not to announce um that the murdered and or missing was a sex worker unless the family themselves come forward and say so. So initially the whole point of it was so that if a person was missing uh, and it wasn't, they weren't labeled sex worker, they would be treated like any other missing person. So on, mm -hmm. on the face of it, that sounds really great. Mm -hmm. However, what also happened is statistics. We can't collect them because we don't know unless we knew the person personally, that they were a sex worker. Right. Which means that the nice folks over in uh, the House of Commons can stand up, and one of them did, and said, well, we looked at the five years before uh, PCEPA came into play in 2014, and the five years hence, and we've determined that it is safer because less sex workers have been killed. Well, no, your statistics don't bear out because you don't know the answer to that question because we don't announce it anymore. Right. So it's probably just as bad, perhaps mm -hmm. more, 
but we can't prove it. Here in Edmonton alone, in 2020, three sex workers were killed. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it was, I don't think, one of them for sure did not get announced in the paper. Uh, actually, two of them did not get announced in the paper. The third one, the family came forward and said so. So, you know, there's two right there that uh, wouldn't stand out as a statistic, and we mm-hmm. will never know. And the more we bury this, uh, this thing where, you know, we announce that they were or weren't sex workers, mm-hmm. the less we'll be able to collect those statistics for ourselves and say, hey, wait a minute, you're still killing us, because they are. Right. You know, and it's it's really unfortunate, and it's like I can I can see – and not personally see and understand, but I, it's like you can hear people's stigmas around that when they find out like, oh, you know, well, she was a sex worker. She went to his house and then, you know, well, he killed her. And then it's almost like they have no remorse or sympathy for the woman in that situation because it's like they you get that whole attitude of, well, what do you expect? You put yourself in that position. And it's like, no, no, no. That has nothing to do and does not change whatsoever the messed up situation of a person, you know, harming another person, regardless of the way that they came across this person. People get attacked in the woods walking. People get jumped in their vehicles. You know, like being a sex worker is not what dictates, you know, whether or not this person is going to be murdered or the man is a murderer. It it literally is them and yet they attach the two together and 100 percent. that's one of the reasons that the city of edmonton has made such a move toward making sure body rubs are the place where most sex workers will be working Mm -hmm. they know that statistics bear out we don't get killed in these places Mm -hmm. typically it's a very very low statistic um that harm comes our way uh but an escort or somebody working on the street or doing car mm-hmm. dates those those stats jump right up so it it really we need society to get on board i think the city of edmonton is on the right path mm-hmm. um we just need a safe place to work we're gonna work we're gonna mm-hmm. work any which way we're gonna work no matter what the laws are mm-hmm. so how about since we already know we're not getting rid of it how about working with us and giving us the same pl- safe place to work all across this country Absolutely. And in a way that you guys are still making the money. And I know that that's probably, I know that's a lot of it. I do know a few girls who do mostly in calls. Um, they did used to work in the the massage parlors and they just said that for what I make and what I take home compared to what they take a cut of, um, you know, like it's not worth it for me. I can make more, but it is one of those things that it, your risk factor does go up, um, you know. But working- you know, it's, it's the same thing, you know, when we go into any place to work, uh, sex workers aside, mm-hmm. the boss makes money and he pays the employees, whatever he, mm-hmm. we, whatever arrangement he has made. And nobody, nobody gets super upset. That the boss at the end of the day is a millionaire and, and they themselves as a worker, might have had a reasonable living mm-hmm. because that is what happens right and it's it's up to um a sex worker to find that place what uh, there are places that run like co-ops there's nothing free in this world mm-hmm. um rents for these studios are somewhere between you know a minimum 2500 to 4000 5000 dollars a month plus you still have utilities and insurance and accounting right. and supplies that costs money so it's not that there's a greedy entrepreneur at the top there might be but mm-hmm. not always and yeah there's a cost to everything so what are we doing are we are we <laughs> what i actually tend to see is let's just make it really quite a simple simple amount for every 100 dollars a person might make um at home if that's where they're working mm-hmm. Um, they would be charging over and above that if they were working at a studio so the studio could make its cut. So the only person that benefits from the worker that's at home is the client because he Mm -hmm. doesn't have to pay that overage. But 
that just means that a person has to decide whether they want to work safely or not. And right. if you're at home and, you know, you've got a friend there in another room that nobody knows about that can, that's got your back. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Most people don't. And most mm -hmm. people work by themselves. And that's when things go sideways for some of them. They'll sometimes get robbed. They'll sometimes get beaten. And sometimes they get killed. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen in body rub. So at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what's it worth? <laughs> what's My your life. safety worth? Yep. Yeah. So there's that. Right. But everything costs money. If you're an escort, it's going to cost you money because you're going to be paying for your car payments, for your insurance for your gas and any mm -hmm. accidents are on you any maintenance is on you if you really took out the pen pen and pencil and paper you'd figure out that that costs money too there's nothing right. free in this world no it's so true um do you find that this industry is a growing industry or a dying industry neither i find that it's fairly stable over all okay. the years it's always you know there's ebbs and flows just like there is in the oil field and maybe that's where i'm coming from anyway because i'm in alberta right and so you know there, when there's tough times and not so tough times and you know but overall no it's not a growing industry it's stable okay yeah it's because it's interesting right because you think that i mean i guess like i look at say the stripping industry and it's like i see locally here in edmonton how you know back when i did working clubs or i did bachelor parties um you know there was six or seven strip clubs in edmonton and now we're down to two you know and it's like so you see like that it's like okay so the stripper industry i mean there's still a plethora of strippers out there and parties going on but as far as the clubs and having the busyness of the people going to those places you know, that it would appear in certain places like it has died out compared to what it was. So then I've well, always wondered. I think there's a couple of things that happen kind of simultaneously. One is certainly the pandemic where mm -hmm. we were discouraged from going and doing things in large groups. Um, the other is the Me Too movement. And mm -hmm. suddenly young men were told that just because they can and could, they shouldn't. Right. And that kind of put the curb on some of that um having said that they still do and they might not do it with the same frequency right but when times are good and you've got especially in alberta a large group of mostly men that are up in the woods mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah up in the camps and uh doing without when they get their time off they want to come into town and have some fun mm -hmm. and and they will and uh, yeah, so there's more. I, I don't see it so much as um, that that it stopped. It's more more like it's migrated. Okay. So just like it came from you know the streets to the indoors. Uh, now we've got the girls that are doing exotic dance, thinking, well, maybe I should shift to mm -hmm. OnlyFans or or uh, you know chat or maybe even go into a body rub and do it you know do things right. so yeah it's just more of a migration it's like okay well it's not working here let's see if it works there right okay so it's it's changing i guess with the times of things that are changing but you know it's so true that uh what you said about people working and then coming and wanting to have fun and let's be honest the way that you know the dating industry and any of that has gone and changed drastically for a guy who has let's say five days off from work and he's got it going into town, going out with his buddies, the whole trying to pick up a girl, have a good time, get laid. Let's be real. That's what some of these yep, guys are looking for. That's a goal. It's going to cost them way more money, wasting it on buying somebody drinks in a bar, hoping that they're going to go home with them and have a good time. than what it is for them to come in, have a shower, you know, call up an escort, uh, go to a rub and tug place and actually just have a good time with mutual understandings of what it is, you know, and absolutely. And yeah. when it comes to the body rubs, they tend to be um, almost all sober because it's a destination location that they have right. to drive to. So yeah. they're not drinking, they're not partying, they're not doing their drugs. They're coming here, they're sober, the girls mm -hmm. are sober, and uh, consent is guaranteed if yes. there's an exchange of money in the transaction. Yeah. Whereas what are you doing getting a girl, you know, uh, drunk oh wait a minute as soon as you've done that now consent's not even on the table mm -hmm. so don't get all rapey don't do that you know <laughs> there's they have to be cautious and i think mm -hmm. the me too movement certainly highlighted that beautifully 
um, yeah, there's repercussions to your crappy ways. So how about changing them, right? And just doing it. The it's, it's easy enough to go into a body rub. Just get her done, yeah. right? Yeah. And I mean, I'll be honest. I've said it before in like a few episodes. I think that if I if if I was with somebody in a relationship and they they stepped outside of a relationship, they cheated on me. I would feel way better knowing that they had gone to. Um, you know, an escort or hired somebody compared to going out and seeking it out in a different well, sure, way. There's no emotions involved. Yeah. I mean, if you start having a mistress on the side, there is definitely mm -hmm. going to be. And even when maybe she says no strings attached or he says no strings attached, after a little while that that green eyed monster bites. And next thing mm -hmm. you know, jealousy ensues. And now we've got a a re relationship that, that either you're stuck in mm -hmm. that you don't know how to get out of. Or maybe you end up having a divorce because you've been caught. Yeah. You come into a body rub. It's nice, clean, discreet. You're in, you're out, and it's mm -hmm. nobody's business. Don't yeah. use, you know, I, I, and it always strikes me that funny that people will actually use e-transfer or or credit cards that are joint accounts. It's like, that's mm -hmm. not smart. <laughs> hey, guys, get a separate account. <laughs> no, it's so true. Take out cash. <laughs> something cash works too. yeah <laughs> yeah it's so true there's always a paper trail that they don't even oh, realize yeah. yeah um okay so i have you know one or two last questions for you i know you're busy sure. so I, I won't keep you too long but no i would like to know what is one of in all the years that you've done it i mean no different than stripping there was a lot of shits and giggles ridiculous like stuff that happens that goes on that is just entertaining um, what is some of your most memorable moments working, you know, in the industry? What is it that, you know, some of those things where it's like, it just, those, that... those particular moments, yeah. like the fellow that was a little bit harder to get off. So, uh, I just, I was at his place actually, and I knew that he had a whole bunch of different types of hand creams. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I said, I'll just go grab a hand cream and take this, this matter into my own hands. And I started using the cream and thinking, boy, that smells kind of funky, weird. And a few moments later, he says, gee, that's starting to burn. And yes, I used Nair. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> Not recommended. <laughs> oh, that sounds know why, like it but... would be painful. <laughs> yeah, he never called me again. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know why. <gasps> yeah. There, Job there are foul. Moments. That's funny. <laughs> and yeah, ouch. Oh, that's yeah. funny. So yeah. for you personally, and I'd asked this before to another girl, um, and she said to me that it was basically for her, I mean, sex work for her was it was a performance because I'd ask like, do you enjoy the sex that you're having with, you know, these with your partners? Are you getting off? Or is it really that you are just doing your best to make them feel good? And I... it's, it's acting. Well, I don't know so much that it's acting. I think it's a real pleasure to know that I've made somebody else happy. It's, okay. it's, I'm, I'm happy that they've had their orgasm. It puts a smile on their face. I don't know too many jobs that at the end of the day, people leave not only thanking you, but big smiles on their face and it feels so good. So I'm, I don't think I'm acting so much as I'm just making sure that they've had the best time that I could possibly provide. Okay. And I think that that's really super important. And do they think you're getting off? Like I know in a personal situation, if I'm having sex with my boyfriend, if at the end of that session, I haven't come, he's like a little bit kind of bothered or like they want to keep going to make sure that you're enjoying yourself as well. Do you think it's different with men when they've hired somebody that? Well, sure it is. I mean, some of them will want you to go through go through the motions of having an orgasm. Most mm -hmm. of them though, they they don't have that pressure that they would have in a relationship in a relationship both parties should be happy but ah. when you put money into a person's hands yeah that makes that person happy so now they have to reciprocate by making sure that you had the best orgasm ever <laughs> so so yeah the pressure isn't on the females or the providers orgasm it's a it's on making sure that the person paying gets best bang for their buck 
I love the way that you just reframed and said that because it was just like something clicked in my mind of like 1000% that is a situation where a man does not have to feel guilty for selfishly wanting his orgasm and not having to worry about the other person's. And it's true. Like there's some right? anxiety involved with with women's orgasms. Mm-hmm. Let's face it; they're never really sure that they hit the target. Yeah. Whereas, and and a lot of clients come in here and they're bagged. They've been working up north. Mm-hmm. They've had that long trip back, and they are truly tired, and they just want to be rejuvenated. And sometimes they just want to lie there and let you do everything. So they mm-hmm. want that invigorating massage before they have their orgasm. And yes, that selfish. They drag themselves home and ask for some loving like that. And she's just worked a full day and, and had to contend with the children. She's not going to be all about him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's going to want some payback. <laughs> Totally. And so, yeah, they can come in here and just honestly relax and be selfish and nobody minds. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so true. Yeah, I've never really thought of it like that, but it, it really is, right? Yeah, um, it's true. For everybody listening, if anybody is listening that, say, wanted to get a hold of Answers, wanted to be part of Answers, wanted to um, learn more about the organization, where can they find you guys? We are at info at answersociety.org that's our email okay and answer society org is also our website okay so either way we accept donations very grac- graciously um if they want to sign up as a board member they just need to let us know and we'll send them a, fo- a form same with uh allied member or any there's four different categories of memberships mm-hmm. And if they're a sex worker and they want to check out the site and see what services we provide, just go and answersociety.org and look under services and okay. see what we have that's available for them. Do you guys have a social media page as well, like an Instagram or anything? There's Twitter is uh, society at society answer. Okay. And uh, there's an Instagram, there's a Facebook. I, yeah, I think that's it for right now, but they're okay. all also on our front page. So if you go into, you know, answersociety.org, the icons are there. You just click on whatever oh, your perfect. favorite is. Okay, so people can search it out and get the information right. they need. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing and sharing, you know, not only just for the organization of what's available and just for people's awareness and education of like how the sex industry has changed over the years and the things that you guys are working towards um, to be able to be recognized and have that decriminalization, um, which it should be, you know, and I can't believe that it still takes this long. And I know. it's been this big of a challenge for everybody. Um, and it's interesting for people to be able to know that, right? And Absolutely. Because ha- where else would you hear that? Who, if you're not in the industry and you're not, you know, searching for that information, nobody would ever actually know the fight that you guys have and what has changed and the laws around it and the places that do support you and the places that don't, you know, it's, it's overwhelming to say the least probably for you guys. And then for people on the outside to kind of learn about it, I think is really beneficial. It's true. Mm -hmm. And even our logo, uh, people have wondered about it. And uh, if you see our logo, it's a gal with a firm grip on an inverted umbrella because she's fighting the obstacles as we have been all these many decades. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, If there is anything else, what is one last thing that you would like to share with everybody listening, whether it's personal about your experience in the industry or about the organization? Oh, I just wish people would, you know, check out our website, listen to this podcast and others. Mm -hmm. Think about maybe even um, signing up for the Sex Workers Work Bias Prevention Training that we offer that's an hour and a half long. And we do that once every six or eight weeks uh, by, by a small donation. And it just teaches people uh, what sex work is genuinely Mm -hmm. all about and the barriers we face, the stigma we face, and how they can change their own biases once they've come through the process of listening to us Mm -hmm. and maybe maybe make a personal change themselves in how they speak and how what vernacular they use when talking about sex work and sex workers. 
Yeah, I saw that you guys have that. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to take that the next time that it is offered. Marvelous. I'm excited to take it. I'm excited to learn all about it. And I'm actually, um, I've applied and I need to finish my application to be an ally for your guys' organization. Oh, Marvelous. Um, Love to have you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I this It feels like one of those things where it's just like, because I'm so passionate about changing stigmas in general around sex, um, all the industries, it just felt like one of those things where it's like, you know, it felt important to be able to be part of and to stay in the know of the information of what's going on. So I can also continue to share that with, you know, everybody else listening as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for coming on. You guys, I hope this was educational for you. Um, let me know when you guys listen, if you have any other questions, you guys want me to reach out to Mona, to the organization, and we can get more information for you guys and hopefully have, you know, you on and maybe some of the other girls, if you guys want to come on and we'll do like a panel type of episode, um, just talking about it and openly sharing about experiences and, you know, the trade and stuff like that. So hopefully we can do that in the future as well. Thank you again. Thank have you. Have a good evening. Okay. Bye. Bye.